Welcome to Myanmar Musings, a podcast of the Myanmar Research Centre at the Australian National University, Canberra. I'm Luke Corbin. It's July 15, 2021, and today we're bringing you a special recorded conversation between Kim Zo Win and Nicholas Farrelly at the Myanmar Update 2021 conference. Kim Zo Win is a long-time outspoken political commentator in Myanmar and director of the Tampa Deepa Institute. Nicholas Farrelly is Professor and Head of Social Sciences at the University of Tasmania and was previously at the ANU for many years, an integral part of Myanmar studies there. The two of them discuss the COVID-19 pandemic, the 1st February military coup and the current state of play in Myanmar's politics. There is an extended question and answer session where Nick relays questions sent to him via Zoom and live from audience members in Canberra at the Australian National University. Just a heads up that Kin Zor Win dialed in remotely from Myanmar and there's a little bit of audio interference from wind noise. Without further ado, I hand it over to Kin Zor Win and Nicholas Farrelly. Miglab Asaya, how are you? Yeah, nice to see you again. Very nice to see you too, Kinzo Win, and uh, thanks very much, Mike, and to the rest of the team there in Canberra. Um, this afternoon's session is going to be focused on the expertise and the experience of Saya Kinzo Win, who joins us to offer his insights on the situation in Myanmar, noting that there's been a great deal of discussion over recent hours and recent months uh, about the consequences of the 1st of February coup. Uh, Kinzo Win, of course, brings an incredible depth of experience. He is notable as a think tank leader, as a writer, and as a dissident. Many of you will appreciate that Sayar was a prisoner of conscience uh, for around a decade, locked up for his subversive writings and also for his energetic human rights advocacy. So under current circumstances, uh, Sayar, of course, has a great deal to offer the conversation that has been convened by the ANU Myanmar Research Centre this month. We're deeply grateful, Sayar, for, for your contribution. You are a very old friend of this conference series. Um, we have always perhaps under kinder, gentler circumstances, uh, benefited from, from your insights and input. And of course, we need to be grappling with uh, today's conditions uh, as effectively as we possibly can. And so the, the plan for today is that I'll engage, uh, say, uh, in some brief conversation for, for say, 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll use half an hour for uh, conversation uh, for questions. Um, we're all really keen to, to hear your contributions, Saya, uh, and let me just get started by asking for your broad assessment of conditions in Myanmar right now. What's just happened uh, and what do you think the trajectory over the coming months looks like? Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, well, the biggest thing right now in Yangon and in other parts of Myanmar is the third wave of the pandemic. You know? Oh, well, it's, it's um, hit the hardest. You know? We were very lucky in the first and second waves. We thought that Southeast Asia would be spared, but this um, third wave has been unrelenting. There's a very frightening video clip from one of the news services yesterday at a crematorium in uh, Ye Wei outside uh, Yango, where coffins were just lined up to be cremated. You know? And uh, till 7 p.m. it has happened. Well, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Well, we saw that in India. Well, that's the uh, thing uppermost on our minds. But um, the, the direct consequences of the coup, well, it's been five months. They're not going to go away anytime soon. You know? uh, we just hope that they won't get worse. I've always maintained that it's going to be a long run affair. And um, I've tried to look at it from all angles. Uh, but I think uh, I'm sorry to all the audience that I have to give a very negative and very honest assessment. Yeah? Well, I could just oh, whitewash it and say, all oh, these things will go away. We'll have reconciliation soon. But that's not going to happen. I'm sorry to say, well, I lived through 1988, but this time it's much, much worse in a way. And um, there's even some black humor going on that Burma Myanmar is being affected by the two Cs. One is the coronavirus and the other is the coup. 
well, it, it's quite true. By and large, the country has been quite resilient up to now you know, because we have our, what, what, what we can say, our native strength, but I don't know how long it will last. Thank you, Sayo. Those are, I think, excellent framing comments. Um, perhaps just going back to, to some of that history, as I mentioned by way of introduction, you spent a decade as a prisoner of conscience. Uh, we now have a new generation of political prisoners locked up by this revitalised uh, and muscled up military government. Can I just put the, the blunt question to you? Has anything changed? Well, as you can see, the bedrock hasn't changed. No? What we are seeing is only the um, icing on the cake, or you can say the waves on the ocean. Yeah? The real undercurrents currents have not changed. And uh, I think the democratic leaders have been fooled all along. Yeah? And uh, yes, you said generation. It's been 30 years since, uh, 30 plus years since 1988. But um, in all those years, we thought that there, there might be a pacted transition or kind of reconciliation, civil military relations and all that. Not time and money had gone into that. But the basic premise of the military has not changed. And lo and behold, it's erupted and surfaced now. But I think that um, the country has been set back many decades. You know? All that we've tried, we've managed to build in the past 30 years, and we have that is, is now being almost thrown away. And you talk about the new generation, they're all under 30, and they've tasted freedom, they've tasted foreign travel, you know, and the uh, wonders of the internet, you know, and they don't want to go back to those old dark ages. Some of them even don't know that. And, and that is the, one of the main obstacles in the path of the hunter. You know, I don't think uh, up to this moment, I can't say that there are any winners yet. You know, well, a lot of people have died on both sides, but uh, we can't be sure that the hunter might win no matter what it does. So with, with that in, in mind, Kinzo Win, and, and of course, um, Myanmar, as a, as a member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, has been uh, receiving diplomatic feedback from its immediate neighbours, uh, from countries such as China and India as well, and then from so many other governments around the world, uh, many of which have expressed their outrage uh, when it comes to the direction of political and economic developments and their great sorrow in terms of um, these, these developments. I, I suppose, given your experience, everything that you've seen over these recent decades, what kind of response would you be recommending, particularly when we think of Myanmar's immediate neighbours in the Southeast Asian countries? Very good question. Uh, first of all, um, there's been a kind of a, a mosaic in that kind of responses, you know, internally from our different ethnic groups in different regions and externally from our neighbours and the um, broader international community. But what I'd like to say is that, um, yes, Myanmar is a member of ASEAN and there was some trouble getting in in those past days. And at first glance, things were going very well you know, in the region and our neighbors, including Australia and all the middle powers and big powers. You know, there were no serious problems, perhaps with China in its investment. And suddenly this thing happens. And uh, I think um, a lot of people, not only people inside the country, but also friends abroad, were caught off guards, were caught on the wrong foot. And um, they had to scramble to uh, respond. ASEAN isn't even ready yet. I feel that ASEAN isn't ready yet. And they don't have a collective response. Well, they can't even decide on a special envoy from Myanmar, whether that person is going to come from Thailand or from Malaysia or from Indonesia. So I think um, my advice to ASEAN was that they'd better get their act together, literally. You know? And um, in the broader region, well, uh, China and India particularly have been very reticent and they have vast interests in Myanmar. You know? And uh, I think they are biting at the time. Uh, India, of course, has been open in asking for advice. Uh, China, less so. so. And um, we'll have to see in... Uh, the coming months, you know, how it's going to pan out. And um, like I said, it's going to be a long, drawn-out affair. And, uh, well, one thing, there are entry points 
well, the pandemic, for instance, you know, and uh, some people are talking about providing lots of humanitarian assistance to Myanmar. And this is a good enterprise. Uh, whether you like the regime and you, whether you like the junta or not, the people there are dying of the coronavirus. And so they need vaccine. We, we were stopped right at the time of vaccination uh, in February, and that's all been wrecked. And we don't know where the next batch of vaccines is going to come from. Well, that is a good entry point. If they really think like human beings and get their hands on the real problem, you know, but uh, even that, I think, is doubtful. So there's a lot to do, even in terms of the basic um, essential humanitarian assistance and what our friends would accomplish in this regard. Thank, thank you very much, Kinzo Win. And con considering those entry points, but also the, the heartbreaking circumstances that you've just sketched out, and perhaps turning our attention here somewhat closer to home for those of us based in Australia, what, what would be some of the specific advice that you might seek to offer to a country like Australia, uh, which of course, you know, does its best to work through multilateral channels. And yet, of course, the frustrations with the ASEAN mode of engagement are significant right now for so many different players. What, what is it that a country like Australia, in your mind, should be doing? I think a lot of countries, including Australia, are really betting on ASEAN. That's why I said ASEAN will have to hurry up and get its um, program together. But um, first of all, for a country like Australia, we've had a long uh, relationship. Democrats also both were parts of the um, British Empire. I think, number one, we have to stand on principle. This time, uh, we have to deal with the hunter quite firmly. Uh, I don't mean just uh, threatening this and threatening that, uh, but we have to have a very firm position. Uh, very early on, the Australian defense chief uh, called the number two in the army, and he said the right thing, you know. But the thing is that, oh, number one, for the Myanmar military, you'll have to say these things again and again. You know? They are somewhat in another world. You know? And number two, will they really listen? You know, you, they're, they're mentors you know, and very um, big donors like Russia and China. Will they really listen and listen to reason um, above all? But I think in Australia's case, I think it's very important, Southeast Asia as a whole, the region, number one is that we have to have a principled stance and uh, recognize that what especially Generation Z is really attempting to express is that the Myanmar people have had a taste of democ democracy for a long time, and they're not going to get that, not going to stand for that democracy to be snatched away from their hands. You know? And even the uh, millennials are talking about that. So um, this is not just another developing country new to democracy. So on this basic principle, I think we have to make a stance. And it applies to all, demo all democracies and especially to Australia, a very important neighbor in our region. And secondly, I think uh, the wreckage of the consequences of the coup. You, know, you see it in... Um, people's lives disrupted, the economy in disarray, and the pandemic raging. I think those are the practical uh, nuts and bolts uh, assistance that we require. And um, finally, I think we have to look at the long run. We can't be complacent anymore. Uh, myself included, of course, I was in prison. But uh, we took the things, uh, the, the um, sequelae of 1988 too lightly, and we were complacent. We can't repeat that anymore. So that's why this institution or the military has to reform and change. And we have to redouble efforts to do that. So things like um, education exchanges, especially the younger generation, you know, we'll have to concentrate on that. It's not enough giving um, uh, courses and seminars on election monitoring. Look what happened to the election. You know? One of the reasons I'd also like to add is that the people of Myanmar had voted just three months ago. Um, in February, and they're not going to get their uh, votes just uh, squashed into the ground you know, and thrown away just like that. And that is what I meant when people say, when, you, when I say that the experience of democracy has gone deep into the people, into the public, maybe not into the politicians, and certainly not into the military. You know? uh, so that's 
one big plus for us, people are willing to die for that. If I, if I may say something as sensational as that, people are willing to die for their freedoms and for their democracy, and that must be cultivated further. You know, it's going to be a long run thing, and I am very glad that we have friends in Australia who will be able to, like you, who will be able to carry it further. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Kinzo Wen, and thank you for, for sharing um, so much, both of your own personal analysis, but, but also your appreciation of this big picture, whether it's the, the region's geopolitics or the heavy responsibilities on those who are committed to democratic governance. Yes. And as we have all seen, Kinzo Wen, the, the, the bravery, the creativity, the um, and the utter resolve of those who have contested this military coup is simply remarkable um, and admirable and quite breathtaking. And so um, to, to benefit from, from your insights this afternoon is a, is a great honour for all of us. And I know that there are questions from around our, uh, our Zoom room. David Camro from Paris, and I'm just going to read the question, Kinzo Win, so that everybody can, can benefit from David's summary. He says that some would argue that relying on ASEAN is a cop-out. ASEAN has neither the institutional capacity uh, nor the political will, and that's, of course, because of its, its own authoritarian leaders across different ASEAN nations to encourage democratic change in Myanmar. Um, how does that sound to you, Saya? Well, I must say that, honestly, it's a very valid point. You know? And I brought in ASEAN because, well, it is really the organisation that is most ready, in, in a way, to respond, but uh, let me let me go back a, a few decades. Even since Cambodia, the Vietnamese um, invasion of Cambodia, I had very deep reservations about ASEAN as a whole, you know, and especially in international relations and like things like peacekeeping. It does not have the expertise. I did want to go very deeply into that, you know, and be very harsh in my criticism, but I said that ASEAN needs to get its act together, and that I see it broadly includes everything. And the other point is that ASEAN is um, deeply divided as well. There are at least two camps. There are ASEAN countries who simply don't bother about Myanmar, and there are countries that do, most of all Indonesia. We're very grateful for that. You know? But um, I think uh, there's been a summit in Jakarta where May Online went. You know, they didn't. They weren't able to accomplish much. And um, some friends of mine were trying to get an ASEAN humanitarian program together. And I said the same words that ASEAN does not have that expertise during like Lone August um, 2008. You know, well that was a lucky break because um, the UN and the EU chipped in. And um, some people say the, the, the person of a uh, Thai foreign minister, Surin Pitsuman, helped a lot, you know. Now we don't have that. It's a very half-hearted response. At the back of the minds, some people might, in ASEAN might think Burma has always meant bad news for us, you know. And uh, this is the, a crisis of their own, me of their own making. Well, can't they sort it out themselves? Why do we have to sort it out? So that's the kind of mindset that they have. But I think, uh, well, it's nearest. ASEAN happens to be the nearest uh, organization, but um, the UN and the EU also has to uh, weigh in, in a way, you know, and also other countries like Australia too. So I think um, if you just talk about the entry points that I mentioned earlier, it's okay. Let me end by just going back to the one very fundamental point. ASEAN is talking about reconciliation and about dialogue. Those things will not happen. Yeah. And that's the gap in the perceptions and the lack of expertise that is quite apparent. Yeah. Nobody is really inclined for reconciliation yet. So we have to and start with other things. I'm sorry to say, um, ASEAN will have to really look deep and hard at the question and not just look for um, textbook examples or lifting little phrases and concepts from here and there and say, do this, you know, those, those prescriptions uh, won't, won't ban out at all. So we have to be very circumspect about that. 
Indeed. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sayar. And I, I note that we have a series of questions coming through Canberra. So we might- Hi, folks. I'm just jumping in to quickly introduce the person who's approached the microphone to ask Kinzo in a question. It's Dr. Jane Ferguson, anthropologist and lecturer at the Australian National University. Yeah, so good to see you. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, um, but, I mean, I know this is Myanmar update focusing on IR and ASEAN and that sort of thing, but I'm really curious to know what you have to uh, say about um, all of the interesting spiritual movements, the um, Yariya and the Bidinsia, yeah. like uh, the effect of the certain monk uh, allegedly crashing in the Air Force plane and um, these sorts of uh, astrology project predictions on the ground, because I know you're talking to people um, there and, and whether we can think about um, whether the alignment of the planets, uh, what, what, they, uh, what they bode uh, for the, the future of the, of the generals and the um, various astrologers that they consult. I'll respond to you in the little time that's available. Well, um, in Bagan and also in those central Burma towns, women especially came out and did something that I haven't seen in my whole life. You know? And Jingza, I mean, Jingza Taite in Burmese, saying that we are putting a curse upon the Hunza. And they carried mm -hmm. uh, coconuts and, and bananas in the Korobo way, and they were ordinary, simple village women. But it was done two or three times. And uh, I think uh, nothing happened to them. Uh, they weren't arrested or anything. But in the Burmese psyche, you could say, and in, in the culture, that's a very strong undertaking, I would say, you know. And uh, of course, we don't see much about astrological projections. I think the astrologers were, were, were very wrong. There was um, a discovery that in Pagoda and Nipidor, they had um, really made very grotesque images of the Buddha, you know. It's made of marble, but the head is turned backwards. And I think those images are removed. In a way, that's black magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the monks, well, uh, notably uh, Buddhist monks have been very reticent, almost silent in a way, you know. But um, yes, the, almost at the flick of a finger, people are ready to jump to conclusions, like the plane crash. It happened at a very low altitude. And uh, there were no mountains around, uh, and these gun was there. And it was a beachcraft um, and was carrying monks as well as some rich people who had come to consecrate a pagoda. And people really uh, saw a lot in that, that um, a lot of what we call the, the mita from the people the, the, no, has been effective. Mm -hmm. And people who just managed to be um, aligned with the hunter are going to pay with their lives. So it's very interesting if you collect all that. There are quite a lot of uh, anecdotes and stories for that. Great. Thanks very much, Jane. Uh, so yeah, to some of the questions that have, have come through, and we might have a four or five of these. So um, some, some brief answers, if, if that's okay with right. you. Right. Um, first of all, from Hunter Marston, uh, who's a PhD student at the ANU, Hunter asks, what will it take to get the international community to recognise the national unity government? Would doing so facilitate or impede a potential diplomatic breakthrough with the military junta? Well, uh, Brisbane is saying, it's going to take a great deal of effort to do that, you know? And um, uh, my own opinion is that the NUG serves a purpose by being an elected body and not anything beyond that, you know? And they have a lot to, they have a lot, a long way to go, you know? But the only, shall I say, value at this moment is that it is an elected body, you know? And that we can use it as something, as a mooring point or something, you know? But, um, I really don't expect much from it. I don't think uh, other people should expect very much about it either. Lots of people in the country are in two minds about it, you know, whether we should all support it or out uh, or otherwise. Well, it's also a consequence of the NLD's, let say, mode of governance and a choice of people. You know? They don't train the second line people, the third line people. And so at a moment like this, you know, it's very acute. They don't know what to do. 
Thank you, Sayar. So uh, the next question, which comes through from an anonymous attendee, relates to the role of of ethnic groups. How do you see particularly the ethnic armed organisations fitting into this picture? Well, that's a very interesting uh, uh, point. I think Jane Ferguson should also work on it. Like I said, uh, the responses to a very critical time and event in Myanmar are so varied. And uh, that leads us to the basic mistake that many scholars and observers make, that they lump all the ethnic groups together. Like you, if you know Burma even for a few years, you know that the way that they uh, think and act are vastly different. And the whole thing about forming a federal union also runs aground on this, hits the rocks of this diversity. Well, to cut things short, I think Many of the, or all the ethnic groups have responded differently to the coup. Well, I'll just have to name names. There's nothing going on in Rakhine. Rakhine could be another country in another world. They're not doing anything. Schools are open. They suffered a lot in the preceding years. I myself went to Rakhine a year ago at my own expense because nobody else was going. And it was really bad. Now, the Shans are fighting each other. No? The EAOs who have really responded in a strong way are the KIO, the KNU, and the Chins. Yeah. There are others too. Look, look what's happening in KR. So we could make a reassessment of what the ethnic people and their EAOs and their parties feel about this. You know? And um, I think um, when and if things return to a semblance of normalcy, I think their response is political at that time, really different. You know? And uh, one last point is that we, there's a new book, it's called The uh, Anthropologies of Revolution. Anthropology has been brought in belatedly to the study of revolutions. I think it's very important at this point, especially for, for, for Myanmar, for Myanmar, the anthropological uh, perspectives of each ethnic group will be different. You know? We can't afford to lump them together. Thank you very much, Kinzo Win, for, for those comments. Our, our next question comes from Nicholas Koppel, um, who is a former Australian ambassador to Myanmar. I hope of he's well. <laughs> yes, indeed. And it's, it's great to have participation from government officials, current and retired. And so thanks very much, Nicholas, for, for joining us. Uh, his question is uh, related to the military council and the former ambassador would like to know that if the military, well, what happens if the military council continues to fail to take effective control of the country? Uh, do you, kids or win, think there is any likelihood of internal division within the Tatmadaw? Uh-huh. Well, first of all, uh, um, I'm so glad to see that, Nicholas, you are well. And um, this question, I think, has been asked uh, repeatedly many times. You know? uh, there was one very, um, let's say, muted uh, division, and that is Lieutenant General Yabie. You know, he was the chief military representative in the peace talks, and he disagreed uh, slightly, and so he's been shunted aside. Uh, there have been no cases of uh, senior officers or even middle rank officers breaking ranks, you know, and uh, mutinying with the, with the troops. There have been quite a number of um, officers. The highest, I think, is the rank of major. Okay. There's a lieutenant colonel from the medical corps who joined the CDM, you know, and uh, we don't know the exact uh, uh, numbers, but uh, what they are saying in the view, in their interviews is very valuable. I would like to uh, encourage all scholars abroad to really study the interviews that those officers give. You know, they're really committed. But uh, at the um, really major and um, decisive level, I don't think there are any breaks in the ranks. And that, of course, brings us to this collective, um, the bonding of the officer corps. You know, they know they have to hang together. <laughs> so, so, and uh, it's like a, a corporate response. And it's been drummed into them. You know, I don't think uh, they can even think uh, individually in this regard. And so it's very hard to imagine them breaking ranks. But uh, we even hear uh, rumors, it's been unfounded, of the, the number three who's been uh, shunted aside, or something, but it's not been confirmed. But my um, 
um, impression, assessment is that what I've just said, uh, there is this corporate bonding and corporate thinking which is very hard to break. Thank you very much, Sayan. I, I can see uh, Justine Chambers. We'll, we'll go to you for a question and then I'll go back to the final question from an anonymous attendee in the Zoom chat. Justine. Thanks, Aya. It's great to have you with us. Um, I just wanted to have a get a sense from you. There's all these conversations um, going on in kind of the media and Twitter um, about how sort of the Bama majority have had this reckoning with the experiences of ethnic nationality communities. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you, is, do you think that, that is actually, those conversations are happening, you know, amongst ordinary people in Myanmar? Um, you know, do they feel a sense of empathy, um, you know, with the experiences of people um, in Kachin and Karen State over the last, not just, you know, 10 years, but, you know, five decades? And also, um, you know, even further than that, the experiences of the Rohingya um, and, you know, are people having those conversations outside of Twitter? Yes, they are. They are. But uh, it's sort of um, mostly in the younger generation and the activist uh, people, you know, and uh, there's some articles written about that and it's really happening to quite an appreciable extent, but it has to run for a long time. You know, it's not just a, uh, something that happens uh, off the cuff, you know, that we can take for certain, but it's happening, especially with the Rohingya. And that's one of the bright, bright points that I see about the whole affair. But uh, like I said in my earlier response, the ethnic people are responding differently. Now, I always go back to the kitchens at AIO. There's been wholehearted encouragement, you know, widespread encouragement for the KIO. It's never happened. I think the, the junta, really has to wake up and see all those things. You know? When battles happen and the uh, KIO wins, people cheer uh, with the KNU and with the uh, uh, KNPP, the KR happens to a certain extent. Nobody cheers for the Tamaro anymore. You know? And that's a, a very important point. It doesn't happen. In, um, it's not just limited to conversations. It's happening in the body politic as a whole. And that's one thing that the people in power should um, keep note of. Now, on the whole, I would say that there has been a um, better understanding among the Bama and the ethnic minorities, all of them, including the Muslims and the Rohingya, which was not apparent before, but we still have to work on it. And the Rohingya has been one step forward, one step back now with the re-emergence of the um, Arakan army and the ANP. Um, the Rohingya are somewhat, you know, um, in a shade again, you know, and um, the NUG hasn't come up with a very firm stance on citizenship. These things have all have to be worked out. But uh, people do realize that, um, okay, I don't want to go back to what people might see as stock phrases. People have come to realize very belatedly who the real common enemy is, you know, and that goes right to the core of people's being, all the bloodshed and all the, uh, all the killings and all the rampages. You know? And this hasn't happened in Burma's 70-year-long uh, year history. I mm -hmm. wrote something yesterday why the military had to really embark on this. You know? They've lost a great deal. And that is something that we really have to follow up. You know? It's not going, to be, not going to see really concrete results anytime soon, but it's really there and we have to follow up. Thanks very much, Justine. It's a great question. And it, and it flows quite neatly, say, uh, through to the final question for our session this afternoon. Uh, and this is a question that, uh, again, comes from an anonymous online attendee. And they're wondering about the future elections uh, that may be convened um, by the military regime. And they'd like to know whether you judge that there are better chances for ethnic parties under these potential arrangements um, and what perhaps would it look like for a proportional representation system um, to, um, uh, to be put in place? Uh, would this allow ethnic parties to mobilise more effectively? And I'm perhaps wondering here beyond this question, if we could just hear your quick thoughts on the future of a multi-ethnic Myanmar federalism. 
Uh, what does this look like for you? What would actually be required in the wake of this violence and the hardship generated by the pandemic? What would be required to, to make good on a more peaceful, more prosperous multi-ethnic federation? Well, for the first part of the question, I myself had um, proposed and lobbied for proportional representation during the first Dane Singh's term, but it was not very well received and we didn't push it uh, very far. Now, uh, the surprise is that May Online, well, not actually a surprise, as May Online has announced that we are going to introduce uh, proportional representation in the next elections. So you have to separate this into two parts. Structurally, well, without much ado, uh, PR is upon us, you know, and uh, of course, there, there'll have to be a lot of trainings and all that. So structurally, really, whether the Junta um, convenes those selections or any party does it, well, PR has been inserted into the Myanmar system. It takes a lot, lot of work to, um, to make it happen. But for the ethnic parties and for the ethnic communities, it's a real thrust. You know? And uh, many of the obstacles you know, and the people are what people are arguing over and the, the federal question could be removed from that. The number two, just as importantly, any election that's convened by the Hunter and by Mail Online is going to be discredited. You know? uh, they say that it's going to happen in two years. Nobody really bothers much about it, you know? and nobody puts, puts much credence in it because it's um, convened and organized by the military, and they're going to be at the top of the heap. And um, we can even guess who's going to be the next president. Well, maybe the next, uh, um, the, 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 the major party will be in the military and they will give uh, proportional representation and uh, privileges to the ethnic, ethnic people almost as a stop. You know? So there are pluses and minuses in it, but at the moment, nobody is really uh, interested in elections as yet. And we don't know whether, uh, when they're going to be held. The second part of the question from you um, is really the crux of everything. You know? And um, I have said early on after the coup, and my, some of my colleagues have done so too, that um, out of this rubble and the bloodshed has come an opportunity. The, the revolution prevails. I, I always accept that. But there's also an opportunity to really revamp and restructure this nation. You know, it's not just the government of the state, a really multi-ethnic uh, state, as uh, Justin has asked, just asked too, and a multi-ethnic population with uh, rights for all. You know? So again, um, we just can't give lip service to this. And uh, to go back to my earlier advice to Australia, these are the niches, you know, and the areas of study that we should concentrate on. More of that. And I'm glad that anthropology has really come in too. But if I were to end on optimistic notes, I'd <laughs> scribble something down uh, yesterday and it was all very negative. But if I were to end on an optimistic note, I think we should take this opportunity that has come out of this bloodshed and the carnage you know, and the destruction to really rebuild a new Burma you know, without the uh, interference of the military or the major political parties or whatever the old generation might think. You know? And um, we have new inputs and say that, okay, we've suffered a lot, but this is a chance to rebuild a new and to prevent you know, and uh, to avoid all these ghastly mistakes that have been committed. You know? uh, there is really a chance. But it won't come easy. Um, at the same time, you could say that um, things could be going downhill. You know? So in a way, I should say that we are almost on balance. You know? Things would go up, things would go down either way. And um, the other uh, point is that the nation states of Myanmar might exist anymore. We would have, we would have a patchwork of smaller entities. Uh, we used to call them protest states, you know, and now people are saying that um, politics is going to be structured on communities and kinship and tribes, you know, and uh, not so much on territory. I think there is a tendency 
towards that too. So I think uh, it's not just um, shouting slogans and lambasting the, the junta, although they fully deserve it. We also have to devote a lot of attention to what you've just asked me, you know, what happens next month and next year as we prepare for a new Burma. A new Burma, new Myanmar is most certainly going to come and we have to be ready for that. We were not ready for the coup, you know, and myself included, we all got, got flat for it. but we should have a plan B and a plan C and also um, let the people and the younger generation know, you know, what we can expect. Um, one of the great concomitant tragedies is the closure of the universities. You know? The universities have been hit, hit by a tsunami. Uh, Young University and Manly University have lost about 500 faculty each. You know? How can they function? You know? And I've been helping, because I'm very close to Manly University, helping students as well as faculty. And uh, when I say these things, you know, we need inputs from academia. You just can't read a book and say that we're going to have a seminar on that. You know? And so we need very deep study on what um, Professor Farrelly has asked. I think that's, that's the uh, culminating question of all. What happens to the Burma, the, the Myanmar of tomorrow? And we have to be, again, ready for it and not be complacent and get flat, caught flat for it again. Thank you very much, Sayakin Zorwin. That's all we're going to have time for this afternoon. Um, please join me in thanking Sayar for all of his contributions. A round of applause. That was uh, a wonderful, wonderful survey of the analytical terrain. Sayar, we are we are all in your debt in the way that you it's have a pleasure, really. Shaped, I really mean it. I really mean shaped it. this conversation. And I think we all feel deeply, sincerely, that we Thank hope uh, the very best for you and for all of our other Myanmar friends. Uh, we know that these are the very worst of times. And we hope that we will be able to welcome you back to a Myanmar update Thank under you. conditions where human rights and democracy in Myanmar can once again uh, be part of the way that the country is conducting its business. So thank you from all of us, Kim Zorwin, for all of your contributions. And thank you for joining us at the 2021 Myanmar Update Conference. It's really my pleasure. And thank you to all the organizers for making this happen at these difficult times. It's really been a pleasure to meet all of you and answer questions and talk to you. Thank you.